Does one AFC East rookie rusher already have a stranglehold on the backup position on his new team? What late round NFC North, uh, excuse me, NFC South sleeper receiver could be a big time draft pick in 2024? And which AFC North tight end is causing drafters to sit up and take notice of him? Plus six time FFPC main event league champions and 2024 pros versus Joe's competitors, Bob Titman and Rick Lowe will drop by for conversations on. Theo Johnson, Demarcus Robinson, and much more. We've got a great show for you. Farrell Elliott is here. I'm Eric Balkman. Stick around. Your high stakes fantasy football hour starts now. Can't stand the pressure. I've seen greater men than the lesson. Broadcast live and heard around the world. You are now watching the most entertaining hour of radio on the planet. Welcome to the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com with your hosts Eric Balkman and Farrell Elliott. The High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour is your home for analysis from the best players in the world. And now, because no one else was available, here are Eric Balkman and Farrell Elliott. Solace in the scripture, are we not all our father's sons? I became a man, nobody ever told me what a man was. Thank you, Rob. Greetings and salutations, all you Balkaholics and Ferreliacs. Welcome to the latest episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com. I'm your slightly above average host, Eric Balkman, and my co-host is the definitive commissioner of fantasy football, Farrell Elliott. If you're wondering why we're coming to you on a Wednesday evening, there will be no HSFA Power next week because I will be at a location in the Northwoods of Wisconsin that is not going to allow for a good enough internet connection for a video podcast. So we are working ahead a little bit. You get two episodes of the HSFF hour this week. I'll tell you what's coming up in a little bit less than 48 hours on Friday night when we go live again. However, coming up on tonight's show, I can tell you that Farrell and I are going to give you our knowledge on Cooper Cup. We're going to talk a little bit about Isaiah Likely as an FFPC draft pick this season and much more before the six-time FFPC main event league champions and 2024 pros versus Joe's drafters, Bob Titman and Rick Lowe join us to discuss best ball strategy in the pros versus Joe's competition as well as the best ball tournament. Um, We'll talk about rookie expectations for uh, Jaden Daniels and uh, so much more. If you want to connect with us on X, you can do so at HSFF Hour, at Eric Balkman and check out Uh, Farrell's Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship over at KFFSC.com. That's KFFSC.com. Post on our Facebook page if you have any questions, facebook.com slash HSFFOR. Email the show at highstakesfantasyfootball at gmail.com as well. If you have any questions for us, now is the time, basically the last time, to send them in if you want them answered in tonight's episode. We'll try to get to all the chat room questions, all the tweets, all the emails, in the fantasy feedback segment coming up later on in the show. Thanks to our audio engineer, my best friend Bryce, and our producer and mutual friend Rob. In case you missed the mailers from the FFPC, or me, as you sent them the last couple of days, uh, the FFPC Fantasy Pros Championship weekday giveaway is back. What is the weekday giveaway? Well, let me tell you. If you sign up, uh, register for a, a Fantasy Pros Championship draft, and draft it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday this week, that means you get two more days to do it, you will be eligible to be in the drawing for three free Fantasy Pros Championship drafts this year. Um, the slow drafts will also count. You just got to make sure that they start by tomorrow at the latest. So register your teams now at myffpc.com. We'll announce the winners via email on Friday. Uh, so hopefully you can cash in on a free $350 team and take your uh, maybe take it to the uh, grand prize million dollar winner uh, circle this year. So good luck on that. Uh, the main event is obviously going on as well. We'll get into a lot of main event stuff tonight. Um, slow drafts have been going on the last couple of weeks uh, over at myffpc.com. If you want to check out the best ball tournament, the Superflex best ball tournament, uh, check that out at myffpc.com. Just $35 to enter that Superflex best ball tournament and a $100,000 grand prize for the first time this year. $300,000 grand prize for the first time in the Superflex best ball tur- or in the uh, regular uh, uh, best ball tournament. Uh, Empire Leagues and Dynasty Startups are also going on at MyFFPC.com. It's your chance to play fantasy football 365 days a year. If you want to play with progressive prize pots, we got that with the Empire Leagues. If you want to play with the classic Dynasty formats that we have, the Rotovis uh, Superflex Triflex, the Superflex Leagues, whatever you want, we have an option for you over at MyFFPC.com. So check that out there. Also, a reminder to like this video, subscribe to the channel, comment on the video, share it with your friends, share it with your enemies, and get notified each and every time we go 
live. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to bring in our co-host for this evening. You follow him on the X at KFFSC Official, but most importantly, you're registering for those Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship Leagues over at KFFSC.com. Happy Wednesday to the definitive commissioner of fantasy football, Farrell Elliott. Welcome in, man. Balky, how are you, sir? And happy Wednesday to you. Dom Gazzetti's already here. Yes, he yes. Hey, Dom Gazzetti never met. We got to get him on the show at some point. We got to get him on the show. show. For sure. Um, let's talk about it. We'll kick things off tonight uh, with the um, Rams backfield situation, okay. which continues to evolve uh, over the course of basically ever since Blake Corum got drafted uh, by the Rams. Now, Nick Shook reported uh, that Kyron Williams said, Blake Quorum can run the ball very well, and hopefully it allows him to get the slot, get to the slot or run routes out of the backfield. Now, Kyron Williams has had this foot issue in the offseason, and the Rams have reportedly told Blake Quorum that they want him to develop a three-down skill set. In other words, be prepared to handle the ball on every single down. Um, Williams is looking at this with a glass half full um, uh, sort of uh, viewpoint, which is probably good. Uh, he said Quorum's addition is going to help him uh, be, become a better pass catcher and, and catch more passes this year and be more of a threat. He caught 32 passes last year for just over 200 yards. I think that's good for, for Kyron Williams, but it's also um, the, the realistic thing is Farrell is he, he, this last season came out of nowhere. He has dealt with, he dealt with some injury issues last year. He's dealing with them again in the off season. And Blake Corum was a day two pick for the Rams this year. Uh, I, I think that this is it, it's good for Kyron Williams in in the fact that his numbers could take uh, a little bit of a hit up, but at the same time, do we still want to invest in Kyron Williams where he's going? Mm -hmm. According to FantasyMojo.com, which is run by Darren Armani, the godfather of the Pros versus Joe's competition at FantasyMojo on X. Anytime we cite ADP on this show, it's always through him. I can tell you that Kyron Williams right now is going as running back eight. He's back up into the second round, Farrell, going at that two twelve three oh one turn. Um, that's still a high price to pay, and I don't know if you know if if he's you know has this self belief that he's going to be catching more passes. I don't know if that's enough for me wanting to pull the trigger at the two twelve. How do you feel about Kyron Williams based on this? I am ready to advise and let the fantasy world go ahead and have their Blake Coral. Let them just push him up the boards. What's the uh, uh, what does Armani have on him? Running back 36 right now at the 909. Is where it's 909, and it was 14, and then it was 11, and now it's 9. In a recent league that I'm in, he's drafted right at value 9. My point is that every year we seem to go through this with the Rams' backfield. Do you reward the new in the incoming guy? Last year, drafters would not reward Williams. When we got to Planet Hollywood, he was still a double-digit draft pick and a late double-digit draft pick. Now we are in a situation that people believe in Williams. He's elevated all the way to the second-round pick. But you have another group of people that believe in Corum so much more than they believe in Williams. And I look at Williams coming into this team last year, and I thought he was a better back. And now you bring in the injury question. And it is all too convoluted for me to spend that second round pick. And I really don't want to spend a ninth round pick on Coram. So I'm going to let everybody else have their shot at the Rams backfield. I prefer to be in business with the Rams receiver and sometimes with the Rams quarterback. And I'll live that way. And I'll let everybody else try to figure out who's going to catch balls, who's a three down back, who's this, who's that out of the Rams backfield. It's not that I really – I'm seeking an answer for this because there is no answer until we see it. What was the kid out of Baseville, Mississippi, that played running back a couple years ago that I always really liked? I think it was number 27. Cam Akers? Uh, no, no. no uh, maybe not number 27. Well, he was, I, I just think the other a, back. A high school running back out of Mississippi that played for the Rams was Cam Akers. No, there's another one. There's, there's last, a, last year, Farrell? Last year or the year before. In other words, he was the same kind of situation. He couldn't stay healthy. The job was his. When he played, he played well. But the the, the Rams didn't particularly ex, uh, respect that and moved on uh, to the next running back. Daryl Henderson was a Daryl. There Henderson. you go, Daryl Henderson. Okay, right. We're two intelligent guys. We should be able to figure this out. Well, you know, it's been a long day, bulky in the world <laughs> over here, and that's all I'm saying. But I, yeah, good job. I love how you set me up because I thought you're saying I'm going to let everybody else take take all the 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 Blake Corum that they want, and I thought you're going to say Kyron Williams. 
And then all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I'm not going to take a guy from Williams there either, which yeah, is you fine. Know, you know, let everybody else try to figure this out because you know, you know, it, but it appears that Blake Corman, as you say, a day two player, and there's nothing wrong with being a day mm-hmm. two player, especially a running back, but it, it's it's almost like he's anointed. And yeah. so let's just let's just it, it, who's going before Williams at before and after. Who's going before and after Corum? Uh, dollars to donuts. I like those players better. Yeah, and I can tell you that Barkley and Henry are the two guys before Williams. Uh, Etienne and Pacheco are the guys uh, right after Kyron Williams. And if we go back, if we drop down to the ninth round where Corum is going, it's Brian Robinson and Devin Singletary right before him. It's Chase Brown and Nick Chubb right after him right now. Yeah, that's, so, that's you know, I, I can find my guys there. And Corum, too, I think is is, you know, you don't like him at that spot, which is fine. Um, and I don't, I mean, quite frankly, I'm kind of lukewarm um, on mm-hmm. that spot. I think I'm going to like him a little bit better than you, but he's going to continue to go up, I think. Yeah, he'll be six. At Planet yeah. Hollywood, he'll be in six round. Um, let's talk about the Jets running backs here, as long as we're talking about rookie running backs. Farrell, uh, Rich Simony, who covers the New York Jets for ESPN, says it's Braylon Allen, who's demonstrated plenty of ability as a pass catcher during OTAs and minicamp this year. Now, Braylon Allen, in his three collegiate seasons at the University of Wisconsin, whoop, whoop, 49 passes is all he caught there. Um, But apparently he showed, quote, excellent ball skills and terrific body control. Bear in mind, not a lot of pads going on right now, too. So I always keep that in mind every time you hear these these reports that are really positive about a player. Um, As long as Brees uh, Hall is is on the field and healthy, he's going to get all he can handle. Braylon Allen is, at best, just um, a guy that may work in once in a while on that team. Um, but he does have value, Farrell. If Hall, knock on wood, were to miss any time this year, all of a sudden Braylon Allen looks like a pretty good spot start that week, which is why we have to figure out if we want to invest with in him where he's going in Fantasy Pros Championship drafts right now. Um, if you look at it, uh, the mojo on him is running back 59 at the 14-10. I guess it's, you know, if you look at the Jets running backs that are being drafted, it's Hall and Allen. I mean, there's nobody else. It's not no Isaiah Davis or Izzy Abanacanda. Like, it is those two guys as far as FFPC players are going right now. I feel like the what what I would give advice on, on anybody who is who's drafting this competition, I would say make sure that you're getting some Braylon Allen. Don't get overweight on him, but a smattering of them. And I bet there is a few weeks this year where he is a top 15 running back. When that's going to happen, I don't know right now, but based on what happens with Brees Hall, I will know. And if he if Hall is out, I think Allen is a slam dunk start. Well, there's an interesting physicality and body type. And you think about that player with what you're going to want with Rodgers. Rodgers is slippery in the pocket, but cannot move like a lot of the quarterbacks that are in the league. So consequently, you think a 235 back who can chip and then catch a a screen pass or a, or a check down pass in today's vernacular might be very, very valuable and find time on the field for the Jets. If you are that advanced in your fantasy football analysis here in June, you're doing much better job of it than me, and I've drafted 30 teams. So, you know, but I, – and I think you, Balky, are a personal fan of Izzy, and uh, I, I think you really like that player. So I would say that it's not just cut and dry that this player is the number two, but he gives an interesting physicality, especially when you play teams – uh, and, and I've been watching a lot of films since we were last together. Um, you know, Philadelphia Eagles, for for instance, in the last six games of the year, they acted like they didn't want to tackle anyone. When you play a team like that and you get a 235-pound running back that can catch the ball and, and turn, put plant his foot and make a cut, then you've got something that can be exciting. So, yeah, uh, I don't know if I want to base my fantasy team prospects on that at this time or even – in the hallway as I prepare to draft at Planet Hollywood. I, I will I will say regarding a band of Kanda, I did like him quite a bit last year uh, because mm-hmm. I thought that he had that three down skill set with that breakaway speed. What concerns me about him this year is not that I changed my opinion on him, the player. What concerns me is the Jets had seven draft picks in this draft and two of them they invested into running backs with both Braylon Allen and Isaiah Davis. Now, maybe those guys just gum up the works. Maybe Braylon Allen is the handcuff. But I think at you know worst or best case scenario for a band of Canada, he's sharing reps with one of those players or maybe both of them if Hall misses. And that's why I'm a little bit down on a band of Canada this year. However, if he gets the opportunity, I do like him out on that field. Um, speaking of an, a guy who needs an opportunity, and this is not something I have considered all offseason, um, but Ray Ray McLeod apparently was getting first team reps 
in minicamp with the Atlanta Falcons right now. Uh, Mark Raimondi, who covers the Falcons for ESPN, said that uh, he performed well in three wideout sets during minicamp, and Kirk Cousins actually hit him for several big plays. Um, Patrick Doherty, who works for Roto World, uh, has already said um, on the X that the receiver room in Atlanta doesn't have to be a very – it could be a closet, Farrell, because there ain't a lot of bodies in there. <laughs> like, it is Drake London. It is Darnell Mooney. And after that, mm, I don't know. So there is a chance that Ray Ray McLeod not only uh, could be valuable with uh, with uh, as the third receiver for Atlanta, but if either one of those guys were to go down this year, McLeod could be one of those rare receivers that come in and get you six for 70 in a touchdown or you know mm-hmm. seven for 80 or something like that in a random week. Um the Falcons offense, I know they have Bijan and Robinson and they want to run. They're going to pass a lot this year, too, with Cousins in London and Pitts and all those guys. Mm-hmm. Um, McLeod, 36 catches, 379 yards. The last two seasons with San Francisco, he signs with Atlanta right now. I don't know if there's any kind of mojo on him right now um, with, uh, with McLeod because, uh, yeah, he's not even going right now. I'd have to check the best ball, um, the, the, the best ball ADP to see if he's going there. But all of a sudden, this guy is at least on my radar, and I think we need to start paying attention to him a little bit. I think if you look at the jump chart of Atlanta Falcons, you will see more receivers that you could also pay attention to. I I didn't see in this article that Rondell Moore was mentioned, and Rondell Moore brings an element to this team. If Ray Ray is not used as a kick returner, um, chances are that he would contribute more to this this offense. But uh, we're looking at a team that we're going to go to London we're going to go to Pitts at least 70 times, and he's going to get over his 1,000 yards. And fantasy players, you may get the touchdowns that you're expecting. So in the situation um, of the Atlanta Falcons, which are going to run everything through Robinson, um, down and distant rushing, non-determinant, it's going to go through Robinson. Uh, check down passes and, and a package developed for screen plays are going to go through Robinson. Don't it? Uh, no uh, empty backfields with Robinson lining up in the slot. That's Robinson, too. It's Robinson, Robinson, Robinson. There's mm-hmm. nowhere for Ray Ray McLeod to get on this uh, uh, to get on this field and to get on your fantasy roster. Besides, but he Robinson. will. But if you look over your shoulder and look at a, at, at a film clip and some ESPN breakdowns and some game highlights, you'll say, hey, Ray Ray McLeod is explosive when he gets his hand on the ball. It's just not going to happen that much. Robinson, London, and Pitts all going in the third round or higher this year. After that, for Falcon skill position players that aren't quarterbacks, it's Algier in the 13th, it's Mooney in the 14th, and that be it uh, right now for Atlanta. We have uh, Bob Tittman and Rick Lowe warming up in the bullpen right now. They're going to come on in just a couple minutes. The last thing I want to get to before we bring our guests on, Farrell, Mark Caboli covers the NFL for the Athletic. I believe the Steelers said that nobody performed better and more consistently for four weeks this offseason then tight end Pat Fryermuth said he may not have dropped a, dropped a pass all month long and has had an instant connection with Russell Wilson. This is something that he's talked about more than once this offseason as well. Um, George Pickens, obviously, at receiver. You have uh, Rome Wilson there. Uh, Calvin Austin we talked a little bit about last week on the show. But Fryermuth has an opportunity to have a big season this year. Um, consider not only the connection he has with Russell Wilson, Consider who his offensive coordinator is. We were just talking about Atlanta. Arthur Smith is now the tight end, or the excuse me, the offensive coordinator there, and he's targeted tight ends 173 times from 2021 to 2023. That's the third most of any team in the NFL, and this could be a fr- uh, Friar Muth year this year. Uh, 2022, so not last year, but two years ago, 63 passes, 730 yards, and two touchdowns. This could be the year of Muth uh, this year, for lack of a better term. And uh, Farrell, as I look at the mojo on him, tight end 14 at the 8-12. I feel like if you wait on tight end, Pat Fryermuth is an excellent backup. I think I did select him in a couple of leagues already this year. I'm feeling pretty good about him. I think you should. And we have, uh, and you know, some of our regular listeners like uh, Permar and Barry Newkirk and uh, and uh, Dom and uh, Billy Hollywood, those guys can all tell you that we've been beating the Fryermuth drum regularly here. And, you know, if you want to listen quickly and closely to the prayers coming out of Pittsburgh, you'll hear some from Friar Muth just begging for a veteran quarterback that can locate him the ball, go through the progressions and get it to him. You know, Deontay Johnson has moved on and out. Other receivers that demanded the ball in those kind of midfield situations are gone. Friar Muth is the deal. And Friar Muth is a player that I really, really respect 
no matter who's been playing quarterback up there, he's been productive. The touchdowns have fallen off in the last two years. The receptions fell off last year. He is ready. I think he is the potential comeback fantasy football Ooh, player of the year. Spicy. And I think that uh, – Ferguson is going to go higher in in the draft than than uh, Fryermuth does, but perhaps Fryermuth has even bigger and better numbers mm-hmm. than Ferguson. I, it's it's going to be big. Um, I, I I'm with you, and he's a guy that you know, unlike um, unlike Blake Corum Farrell, I don't think he's the type of guy that climbs as we get closer to Vegas. I I don't know if he stagnates I, either, but I do think that if he goes up, it's not going to be much. And I think Pat Fryermuth, I can safely say he's going to be a, a sleeper for me pretty much all a drafting season because I don't see him ascending too high up FFPC draft boards for sure. It's unusual to go into the ninth round and get a player that on receptions alone can give you 100 plus points. That's a great point. That's a great point. We have many more great points to make on the show tonight, but let's face it. Our guests know a little bit more than us. We'll bring them in right now. They've won six FFPC main event league titles with their eyes set on the million dollar grand prize this season as well. They make up one of the 42 Joes teams that are going to battle the industry pros in the 2024 FFPC Pros versus Joes Challenge, where each winner will take home a free entry, $2,000 value, into the 2025 FFPC main event. Please welcome on to the show Rick Lowe and Bob Tipman. Thank you so much, guys, for hopping aboard. We're glad to have you tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us on. This That's- is a nice crew, Balky. For a minute, I thought it was the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of look like twins yeah a little, uh, bit. A little bit yeah yeah um so so i want to get uh, i want to get to to know you guys a little bit before we get into fantasy football um can you tell us what you guys are doing for a living bob and i'm let you go first here and then rick pipe in after that well i'm basically an entrepreneur i've done everything in my life right now i have a for 13 years i have a breakfast lunch diner mm. So I have my close at 1.30. So I have my afternoons and evenings and put in the numbers. And Rick and I work out at numbers and everything all the time. They're numbers, guys, Balky. Yeah, we numbers. love it. We love it. Yeah. We love it. Yep, and he, mean, he makes a mean omelet, actually, too. So it's pretty, <laughs> pretty good. So. And where is, this, uh, where is this fantastic diner located? It's in Hughesville, Pennsylvania. It's 15 miles from Little League World Series headquarters. Oh yeah, Williamsport, that. absolutely. What, that. What's what's okay? So so Rick's, uh, or excuse me, Rick Bob, or excuse me, Bob Rick says you make a mean omelet. What's the go-to? What's the omelet? If 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 somebody's coming in there and they're gonna have an omelet, but they're just passing through town, what's the omelet that you make them that they'll never forget? Veggie omelet with pepper jack cheese. Ooh, sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. Um, that's good stuff. Uh, Rick, what about you? Um, I own my own CPA practice here in a small town called Muncie, Pennsylvania. So that's where the numbers comes from. I love that. And, and is, and I feel like your a lot of your team names are the accountant, right? Isn't that, isn't <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. That's when I started. I've been doing it since 2018 in FFPC. And then Bob just came into the picture here about two years ago. So we make up, it's called the uh, country accountants. Is, is, uh, <laughs> His restaurant's called Country Fork, and I'm the accountant. So, do you guys come to Planet Hollywood? What's that? Do you guys come to Planet Hollywood? No, we're not going to do it. We're going to do everything online this year. You guys have got to come to Planet Hollywood and try to help me find a breakfast place that can be (laughs) in all of Las Vegas that can compare to yours. I found a couple, but it sure isn't at the hotel. I can tell you that. Uh, you, get, you got to come to Hughesville, Pennsylvania. You get a hell of an omelet there. That's yeah. what. That's what I need. I need that more. And you know, I had some really, really good questions, but I've been coming up with names, team names with Titman in them. I'm just. I've got three pages so far. So I'm. That's just fantastic. I bet you've heard them all. I've heard it all. Something Balky has heard before, and and I have to ask because it it came up on my chart. And I drafted him. Um, actually, I, I eyeballed him in a draft. I passed over him. I got the Green Bay quarterback, Love. I followed up with Romeo Dubs. Uh, where are you on Christian Watson? And if you can expand that answer to other players within uh, the Green Bay uh, roster. I, I'll guess, Rick, I'll throw this one to you first, but – you know, if, if if Mr. Titmans wants to come in with something 
that it, it like as genius as the omelet recipe, we can listen <laughs> to that as well. But what is the recipe for success in Green Bay? Green Bay? Well, we're pretty high on actually Christian Watson a little bit. We just got him the uh, the other. The, we did a main event online, and we just got him in round seven. We picked him up at uh, ADP at forty one, wide receiver forty one. I think he's going about forty four right now. But I think he has the potential to be a top twenty four wide receiver this year if his hamstring stays in pretty good shape. I guess they figured that out. He figured it out there. So um, pretty high on him. Um, Probably after that, though, we I'm kind of high on Wicks a little bit too as well, though. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, maybe back in both, maybe back in Wicks. I mean, um, backing up um, Watson with um, Wicks would be a great move there because just in case he has an injury or something like that. I think we can all agree the quarterback's there. So I drafted Dubs. I looked at those numbers: sixty catches last year, eight touchdowns, or thereabout. Generally, I could be guilty of rounding up. I hope the CPA doesn't complain about that, but I rounded up. Okay, and and is that doable again? And did I overpay in the tenth round for Dubs? Eleventh round for Dubs? Uh, I think you did actually. I think mm -hmm. I, I think I think just down the road, I think you're going to start seeing Reed take over more, and then maybe Wicks coming into the, into the mix a little bit more too as well, mm -hmm. though. But but it's just so hard to predict what's going to happen there, actually. I, uh, it, it, for anybody who's looking to do that too, Watson, you can get in the end of the seventh round, you can get wicks at the, be, excuse me, the middle part or later part of the 13th round. So it's incredibly easy right. to do if you want to back up Watson with wicks this year. And I don't think that that's all that, um, unintelligent move. I think that could pay off too. Um, let, I, Rick, I know we just uh, threw one to you about Watson, but I want to ask you about, uh, Theo Johnson as well. Um, yeah. I, not necessarily Theo Johnson, but right. Darren Waller's gone, right? There's Daniel right. Bellinger's there. Theo Johnson's there. Um, is the, is whoever that guy is at the Giants tight end, you know, we talk about tight end premium leagues at the FFPC. Is whoever the Giants tight end, um, whoever their leading scorer is going to be at that position, are they going to be fantasy relevant in 2024? Actually, I don't think so. That's my position on that. Um, I've already done right now, I think, uh, two main events. And Bellinger has been going, I think, in the late rounds, maybe round 19. But uh, Theo Johnson hasn't been even being drafted at all. So possibly I think Theo Johnson might come on maybe at the end of the season. He might be a waiver wire pickup. But right now, I just think with where the Giants' the offense is going to be at, there's just there's not going to be value there at the tight end position. That's just how I feel about that. But Bob, Bob, you play Dynasty with FFPC, right? Yep. Okay, and what about Theo Johnson from a dynasty perspective? How do you we feel actually draft? We actually drafted him in our dynasty draft this year. We picked up a team this year and an orphan team, and we drafted him this year as, as our tight end in the draft. And being from Pennsylvania and Penn State, there you go, <laughs> go Nittany Lions. Theo Johnson is very athletic, and Penn State does not utilize their tight ends that much. That's why we we both think towards the end of the year. He could come on, and I think in year two or three, he'll be even better. You got to love the athlete. You really, really yep. do. And Johnson, He's got all that down. You got You got to love the athlete. And if you watched him in college, man. So are you guys Steelers fans? Absolutely. Nope. <laughs> no? Well, tits <laughs> up, Bob. <laughs> this question is for you. Um, probably the – the most under the radar, insignificant, less measurable, non exciting move was Deontay Johnson coming from Pittsburgh to Carolina. I just, you know, th this, this move didn't even register with me particularly. I had to keep double checking back to see if that was the true thing. And as Pittsburgh Steeler fans, I would, what's the first you no? Know, do you think – are you going to miss him, which I think I already know the answer to that. But more importantly, what's the future look like for him in Carolina? Does he make the quarterback better? Does he bleed into Thielen's playtime? Does he become that veteran presence? I don't think so. Uh, what do you think there about the rookie uh, uh, um, Leggett? What's your thoughts – Going down the road to Carolina, now that they've managed to sign a Steeler, I'm just going to tell you, in my mind, I think they signed the wrong one. Mm. I don't. 
Um, the only thing I have to say, the biggest thing I have to say about that is Dave Canales. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, he took Geno Smith and those receivers to the, yep. to the best Geno's ever done. Last year, he took Baker Mayfield and yep. Evans Rashawn White to, to new heights. Now, it is Carolina, and they got a lot of work to do, but Canales is one of the better offensive young coaches in the league. And if not this year, in the next two to three years, Carolina is going to move well up the charts offensively. Deontay Johnson last year was in the top five of separation in football. He gets open. He will get open. Um, Bryce Young will only get better. Mm -hmm. I think Gian, uh, Johnson has the most targets on Carolina this year. Xavier, wow. Leggett, Xavier Leggett's coming on, and he'll be there in the two- to three-year window. But for this year, Deontay Johnson will have the most targets in Carolina. So we'll for a guy like me who agrees with you and likes these Carolina players, I should now move Johnson to the plus column. Bucky, can you help us with some of Darren's numbers on this? Because I think you can put together a Carolina stack starting in about the 10th round, but I could be wrong. Johnson may be going higher, but you're that big. So you liked this player. Uh, you remember the 80 catches. You remember the multiple touchdown years. You liked this player when he was a Steeler. Um, yes, when he was coming on, the problem was the Steelers and their quarterbacks the last couple of years. That To me, that hindered him. Um, Canales is only going is, to is, – to me is the, the X factor offensively. Yeah, and I believe in this coach too. And, you know, he wouldn't have got this job if, if, if he didn't deserve it. So I'm, I'm excited about what's going on at Carolina. Fantasy Pros Championship ADP has uh, Deontay Johnson indeed going as the highest drafted Carolina player this year. Uh, 704 is where he's wow. being selected. A few picks later goes Jonathan Brooks. Adam Thielen, don't forget, he had 100-plus catches last year. He's going in the 14th round. He did fade quite a bit towards the end of last season. Uh, and then Leggett is your 15th round pick. Jatavian Sanders also being drafted in the 18th round. No Bryce Young, though. He is not being selected on average in the Fantasy Pros Championship right now over the last five days. Um, let's uh, uh, shift this to um, C.D. Lamb. This this will be good for you, Bob. Let, <laughs> let's talk about the Cowboys receivers. Everybody knows Lamb is awesome. I've seen him go number one overall in a lot of drafts this year. Outside of him, is there another Cowboys pass catcher we should not forget about this year? We already mentioned him earlier in the show, and you put Fryermuth ahead of him, but Jake Ferguson. Hmm. Um, last year, I believe he was in the top five, definitely top ten in red zone targets, and he did not have a proportionate number of touchdowns to go along with those targets. He will get – a higher volume of the red zone targets for Dallas. His touchdowns will go up um, this year compared to what he had last year. Um, the only concern I have is Cooks did the last five to six weeks, Cooks came on and seemed to have a better rapport with Dak um, over the, the end of the season. So that could bring Ferguson – not bringing down, but it could keep him from reaching new heights. Um, Jalen Tolbert's there. He's an interesting guy to keep an eye on. If you can get him in the 19th or 20th round, he might wor be worth taking and putting on your roster. He is their third receiver. If something would happen to Lamb or Cooks, Tolbert can step in there. He's got better size than Cooks. Um but I think Ferguson's the one. Last year was his second year. He really took a step last year in the second year. Tight ends historically, third or fourth year till they really take a step. Lately, you've had better ones coming in. But I think this is a, this being his third year, he could take even an, another step this year. I don't understand why YouTube is going to ban us, especially with commentary like that. I mean, that, that was that was impressive. I hope I haven't said anything. Yeah. You are the main you are you are the main um instigator tonight, Farrell. I don't that. believe that I'm I'm doing any of this. So I'll have to that's I'll part have... of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I don't want to get accused of being favoritism, so I guess I'll talk to the accountant. Rick, um what what let's go back to LA. I completely dodged the backfield question. <laughs> 
I don't in in all the teams I've drafted, I don't have Puka. I love Puka. Last year in the seventeenth, eighteenth round draft pick uh, for my playing partner Trevor Holt and I, that that propelled us to a uh, a league championship uh, along with Williams. I might add, uh, but you know, too much for me this year. Cooper Cup is an interesting prospect for me because I I think. People are somewhat writing him off. They're looking at the age and and the physicality of to play the position and the way he plays it, and perhaps that, um, you know, the, the, they just don't see the production. So let's go to the third receiver. If Cup loses production, it's not all going to go to Puka. If it did, he'd have 150 catches. So you look at the third receiver, which is. A legitimate thing to do on a team like we just talked about with the Cowboys, and now we talk about the L.A. Rams. Demarcus Robinson, a player I've always liked, have always thought could bust through, given a chance. In this passing attack, is Demarcus Robinson one of those double-digit third receivers that you could be in business with? Yeah, we we think so. Um, just the other day when we were in the, one of the main events online, we got him in the 18th round, and we're pretty happy about that. And Bob has a man crush on him, actually, so that's how he kind of got to know him a little bit better. But uh, last year, week 13 through 17, he averaged over 15 points a game, even when uh, Puka and uh, Cup were on the field. So that's that's pretty good numbers for a wide receiver three. So we're pretty we're pretty high on him. We'll probably have him. That's one of the questions maybe come up, but we'll probably have him a lot in a lot of the leagues that we have. When you can get him in the 17th, 18th round, that's that's great value there. I I, I, I just I think about last year too. Um and and Cup did have his moments, uh, obviously in 2023. Nakua obviously was a one-man wrecking crew. But if you look at how Demarcus Robinson finished the season last year, it was it was really, really good. Yeah. Like he was he was the anti Thielen, right? Where Thielen did all of his damage sort of in the middle part of the season, the early part of the season, and then he kind of petered out a little bit. Um Robinson came on big time yeah. at the end for sure. Um, Rick, let's go back to you uh, on this one. Uh, Jaden Daniels, um, I, I think um, if there's been – if there's a year – I can remember uh, in, in recent history in the FFPC or in fantasy football in general, if there was a time when um, you should wait on quarterback because you could get some elite guys that may have an outside chance of finishing top five, it might be this year. Jaden Daniels is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. Is he a quarterback that you guys want to be in business with this year? Um. Well, it depends. It depends which where we go. I'm this is my opinion on with quarterbacks. You either got to get one of the stud quarterbacks, or you just wait wait the later rounds. Um, I think I'm. We might have more of him if we go with quarterbacks with like Dak Prescott. Once we maybe take a, a later quarterback, we I like to back our pick up right away with another one. So that's when Daniels will come into play, I believe. So. Um, one nice thing is we did get him in our dynasty uh, super flex league that we did get. He was our third pick, actually. So we do have some of them in uh, the dynasty side of it. But right now we've done three or four main events and we haven't got him yet at all. We've gotten we were high on Richardson's and everything there, but we've been backing him up with Lawrence. And um, who else did we back up with? I'm trying to think. Yeah, Kyler Murray. Cool. Other one. OK, Kyler Murray then, too. So um Right now, we haven't got a whole lot of value in him yet, though. But I think he is a good one to have because just he's got the cheat code going with with him with the running. So if he can put up six to eight hundred yards rushing, um, throw in about five or six TDs and maybe twenty three passing touchdowns, that could put him up into the top top twelve quarterbacks, maybe in the top ten actually. So, yeah, we're high on him, but I just the question is we're going to get him because I think he's going quarterback 11, 12 right now. That's right around where Love's going actually as well too. And we're pretty high on uh, Love as well. So we'll see going down the road, but um, I don't know how much business we'll have with him. We, we As Rick said, we do like him a lot. We got him in our um, dynasty league. We were all for Jalen Hurts for – the third pick of the draft and Jaden Reed, and we turned it down yeah. because we thought we'd get Daniels at the third pick, and we did. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and Daniels to your point, ten oh eight right now uh, in the Fantasy Pros Championship, quarterback eleven, just like you said, um, mm -hmm. and and that is that's in the Love Murray um, Brock Purdy territory right now for sure. Yeah, yeah, 
And what's it is a lot of times as we go with a higher end quarter bike, like, like Richardson, we want someone that's going to be reliable. So we're kind of high on Purdy a little bit too. We know Purdy's going to come in. He's going to be pretty steady. Actually. He was nice. We had him last year. We had a Matt, we had Prescott and Purdy actually last year and they were phenomenal quarterbacks and we got them actually late in the drafts. Permar 99, big fan of Jaden Daniels this year because of the, the Kingsbury angle too. Um, yeah. He's planting his flag on it, which I get totally get. Um, I don't think, um, well, fair. I'll let you talk about pros versus Joe's here. I get to talk about pros versus. You do. Yeah, pros. absolutely. Yeah. First of all, gentlemen, congratulations with your inclusion in pros. Thank versus. you. Thank you. Thank wonderful you. thing. You guys are wonderful advocates for fantasy football and the FAPC in particular. Balky, the structure of the league of pros versus Joe's features how many pros and how many Joe's? We're going to have seven leagues this year. In wow. each, in all seven leagues, there will be six Joe's, six pros. It will be a best ball slim format. And the winner of each of those leagues will win a 2025 FFPC main event um, entry. And so, so very exciting that, you know, once you're in, now you get a one in 12 shot, but let's right. face it, none of the pros are watching. It's more like a one in six shot of getting that yeah. free FFPC main event entry. Well, I'm well, glad you really said good. it, Rocky, because, yeah. you know, you, you stole my thunder on that. There's 84 and, you know, Rick, correct me if my math is wrong, but that divides into 42 pros. And 42 Joe's. So you're guaranteed a top 42 finish. That's a really, really good thing. Now, what you guys have had success in the main event. What does being in the pros versus Joe's do for you to get you ready for next year's main event? How does your strategy differ? Um, I know you guys have probably been talking about it because you want to. You want to be impressive in that. It's an invitation. It's why the professional golfers love to win the Masters before anything, despite the fact that the Masters pays worse than everything. You know, you just want and, – and I want to be rooting for you because I like you guys, and I think you've got a really, really good – you know, Pennsylvania is the red basket for football, and it's obvious that you guys have been football guys since day one. So, really, uh, you know, a titular answer – is what I'm looking for. How do we play the pros versus Joes at a level that you guys will be legendary and continue? I'll continue talking about you for the rest of the year. That's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 st I'll start this. And it has to do with me telling it's all yours. Two years ago, we started talking about fantasy. And you brought me in. I call him Master Yoda, and he calls me Grasshopper. So I'm going to defer. This, I'm going to defer this one to Master Yoda. Very good. <laughs> well, this is my second uh, pros versus Joe. I did one back in 2018, and I think I finished fourth overall. So at least I have a little bit of the knowledge there. But um, what we've been doing is we've been doing a lot of best ball, and we've actually done three or four main events. So we're actually gearing up for the pros versus Joe's. So um, it's not a whole lot of difference from with the main event, the, the, what we do for that, for studying for that at all too. Now we might try to try, depending on where we the position we uh, pick from, we might try to do some stacking a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's pretty much, you got to know the numbers, the guys that are going to produce and make the best pick available at that, 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 that round. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Rick, I can tell you of 2019, was it 2019? Okay. 2019, fourth place overall. Congratulations on that. You, you. did um, not win your league, unfortunately. This is this is some crazy stuff here. Yeah, it is. Isn't it crazy? I know. Farrell, out of the top four teams that year, um, three of them were all in the same league, and yeah. and that was Rick's league. Uh, our buddy uh, Adam Krautwurst and Nate Wegman they finished third. They were in Rick's league. Uh, Jeremy Brown from Dynasty Football Factory actually won the league. He took second um, overall. And then, of course, Danny Mueller won the whole thing. Yeah, he well. was in league two, and, and that doesn't surprise me at all. I think the thing that, that I always bring up, uh, Rick, with pros versus Joes is, um, you know, everybody who's who qualifies for it uh, or for, for the drawing gets selected, it's because they signed up for the FFPC main event, which is a managed league. And mm -hmm. some of those guys and, and, and women who play in this, they only play managed leagues. They don't play best ball. 
And I think that's the thing, right? And I think you got the right idea is like, you need to slip into best ball mode a little bit because it is, I mean, there are some subtleties, right? Between drafting yeah. the main event and the, and the, and the pros versus the Joes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, going back to pros versus Joes, you know, it was, I think back, back that when I did that, that's when I really did a good stacking with uh, Lamar Jackson. And I think Andrews of the year, they're the ones that really generated a lot of points for, for that, that, at that, at the draft at that time though. But, um, yeah, I mean, the main event, you know, I think there's more risk in trying to do pros versus Joes. That you're going to reach out for a player that you really want versus a main event where you got to be careful where you don't overreach and take one too early. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, to me, you know, I consider them almost the same, the pros versus Joes in the main event, though. But um, but I'm just ex- kind of excited to do the pros versus Joe because we can put a beating on the, the pros. So, right. the so-called pros. So that's, that's the neat thing about that. And I think in my, in 2019, I don't know. I don't, I think maybe a pro won it though, but most of the top five were actually Joe's like me. So it was, it, it, it's kind of neat. Technically uh, a Joe did win it that year, okay. um, mm-hmm. but a pro finished second. And I, I, I should just, I'll just bring, I had the, I had the leaderboard up. I don't know why I closed it and I'm an idiot, but yeah, out of the top four teams, um uh well no yeah out of the top six i i'm i'm sorry i'm gonna stop talking till i have it in my mind here out of the top eight teams that year top eight teams six of them were joe's right yeah overall and so, the, the pros that might have been in there would be joe's who identifies pros <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's true. Oh, wow. I'm I'm looking at the roster too, Rick. I mean, that was so Lamar Lamar Jackson, Mark Andrews that year uh, yeah. for you. Um, and then I'm I'm looking at something like Tyree Kill, Odell Beckham. Uh, this is it's so funny because you look at this team now and it's like, oh god, this team is trash. But I got to remember yeah. this was five years ago, and a lot can change in five years. But Marlon yeah. Mack and Drew Brees, Jalen Samuels, Deion Lewis, what a trip down fantasy memory lane. Yeah, huh? I got Quincy it. Anunwa, remember Quincy Anunwa? Some yeah. of the pros are drafting those guys. This year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good yeah. stuff. Um, let's get to a couple of emails here tonight, guys. And, and Bob, will throw this first one to you. Uh, it's from Greg in Springfield, Illinois. Hey, guys, how scared off are you of Justin Jefferson in the mid-first round this year because of the quarterback situation? Greg in Springfield, Illinois, thank you for the email. We appreciate it. Bob, I'll, I'll throw it to you. Are you scared off of Jefferson because of that at all? Not in the mid-first round. Um, top five, yes, but he's been going seven or eight. At seven or eight, I think he's still value. He is still clearly the best athletic receiver in football. He produced last year with the menagerie of quarterbacks that he had. He, he still ended up over a thousand yards and was, I think, top 15, maybe close to top 10 wide receiver. He still, he, he was up there. And if you can do that with the menagerie of, of, of quarterbacks that he had last year, just having one quarterback, whether it's yeah. Darnold or McCarthy, who's steadier. And, and plays at the same level each and every game, his his value and abilities will come out and shine through. So at 1-7 one, one to 1-9, one I'm okay with him. Take, if I have those picks in there, I'd be okay taking him. I don't know if I'd want to take him 1-3 over, right. over top of like Tyreek or Jamar Chase. I might not feel as comfortable then. But in mid round, mid first round, yeah, I'm okay with that. A guy yeah. says similar things to me this week. He says I can't picture a quarterback that would affect this receiver's skills so negatively. And I said, Have you met Zach Wilson? And, so that, <laughs> and, and, and that, you know, he his eyes got real big. You know, but I, I believe that uh, you know even Zach Wilson's not going to have as bad yeah. as that. Bob, Bob, to your point, uh, last year, 68 catches, just over 1,000 yards and five touchdowns for Jefferson. You say, oh, that's not that great. But bear in mind, he got hurt in the Chiefs game on October 8th. He didn't play again until December 10th. That's basically two months he missed. And then when he came back and there was no Kirk Cousins, the targets he had for his last four games of the season. Farrell, I know you don't like targets, but I'm going to read them off anyway. I love targets. Double digits in each game after he came back. 10 against the Bengals, 10 against the Lions, 10 against the Packers, and 14 against the Lions Mm. uh, on January 7th. So, and and to your point, he's going at the 107-108. That might be a value uh, for him right now. Mm -hmm. And, And if he could get it done, 
with without Kirk Cousins last year, Darnold McCarthy, it, it could only go up from there. Um, Rick, let's do this email here for you. Uh, it's from Al in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Who's your favorite Chargers running back to draft this season? Thank you, gentlemen. That is Al in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And before you answer, I will load up the mojo on these guys right now as far as the Chargers running backs are going in the Fantasy Pros Championship over the last five days. And you got them all smack dab going kind of close to each other. Gus Edwards running back 43 in the 11th round. Kamani Vidal running back 48 in the 12th round. J.K. Dobbins basically going right after Vidal as running back 50 in the 12th round as well. Do you have a feel on any of those guys? And, Rick, it's okay to say I don't like any of them. Well, I mean, for where where you can get to him, I would probably go with Vidal because he has just more upside than the three of them. We know what we got with Edwards. You know, he's a plotter. Mm -hmm. Um, J.K. Dobbins, we don't know what the injury. You know, he could have a shot of coming through, you know, this year, but the health would be a concern. So, to me – if I had to pick one of the three, I'd probably go with Fidel to try to just with the upside there. Um, I, I am uh, well. Before I'm fresh out of emails, Bob, do, do you agree on the Vidal pick? Yes, I do. He he better receive as a receiver. He'll catch the ball more out of the backfield. Again, at the beginning of the year, I think Edwards will get, will get more options. But as the season goes on, Vidal is going to step forward, and and I think he'll be the starter by the end of the year, mid-year, end of the year for them. Wow. That would be impressive. Yeah. Um, That would also be beneficial to some of my uh, draft masters. Impressive, helpful, and by the way, probably kind of realistic too. We'll Mm. see what happens there. That's the key word. That's the key word, buddy, realistic, because these guys are realistic. These guys get up early in the morning on cold Pennsylvania mornings to go fix <laughs> breakfast for people. And, you know, if, if, if or do their taxes, yeah. guys, you know, because the same people that are serving the breakfast are going to tell uh, Rick next year that they no longer owe taxes on their tips, whether they do or not. <laughs> they on TV, and so they're not going to owe taxes on their tips. And there's so many things that these guys got to deal with. And we've been dealing with guys that are real positive. These guys are positive, but they know the difference in between who they're going to keep and who they're going to fade. So we'll start on the negative side. Who are you guys going to fade? You've already made me a little bit. And it says a Deontay Johnson believer. He's going back on my board. Who are you keeping off my board as a fade? And then we would like to talk a little bit about somebody you love. We already have uncovered Demarcus Robinson, somebody you love that might be off the radar. I'll start with the fade. We, we've talked about this and pretty much where they're going. We're fading Houston receivers. Mm. There's way too many of them. Um, Stefan Diggs checked out mentally at the end of the year. And he was clearly getting last year in Buffalo, the last couple of years in Buffalo, he was, he was the lion and he was getting the, the targets and the shares and everything. Mm-hmm. Now he's got two other dogs to share with. Mm-hmm. And these two dogs are good. Um, I think Collins and Diggs and Dell are probably all one round early. Mm. If they were one round later, we probably would like them better. But mm-hmm. at the at where they're at and the and the guys around them the draft, there's just too much of a question mark as to how the three of them are going to function together in that offense. Question, Balky, where is the uh, Armani on Collins? Collins uh, is at the three hundred five. Diggs is at the four hundred nine. Dell is at the five hundred seven. In a recent draft, I'm doing guys. Uh, Collins was not going to be a third round for me. And I think more drafters are thinking exactly like you are because the fourth round, middle of the fourth round around, and Collins was still on the board. So you're saying if he's there, you're taking it. I'd be more comfortable middle of the fourth round, end of the fourth round. Yes, I would would take him there. Balky is a big believer, I think, in Dalton Schultz. Balky, am I right about that? Don't let me put words in your mouth. Yeah, no, I mean, I I don't say I'm. I mean, I believe in his existence. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe he's a real person. <laughs> so I, then you can you can take that question and that follow up off the board. I'll Who's just, somebody I'll, you love? Go ahead. Yeah, oh, somebody we love. Uh, probably Richardson. Yeah, the biggest guy this year I really love is uh, Richardson for Indianapolis. I love him. 
And just tonight, I just got sniped like two picks right before I was going to take him. Actually, I got sniped in the main event tonight. But I'm I'm really high on him, on him this year. I think he could finish as the number one quarterback this year. I really do. I think he could challenge Allen for that position. I think so much of Anthony Richardson's ADP, which is quarterback five going up to 609 right now, that's people a little bit gun shy after what they saw last, not only what they saw last year, where he ran hard, he didn't shy away from hits. And then this year, instead of saying, yeah, I got to be careful with my body. I got to be out there for as many snaps as I can. He says, I'm not changing the way I play. This is the way I play, which is good, but it's also bad. And I think some of that injury stuff is baked in to the point where now he's falling to almost the seventh round. I mean, that that could be a massive buy. And I'm with you. I, I think yeah. uh, there's there's definitely a non-zero chance that he could finish as the top quarterback this year, especially in consider you have A.D. Mitchell there now to go with Downs and go with Pittman, I, who I know Farrell loves and, and I really like as well. Um, I, and, and Jelani Woods is getting steamed up by a yeah. lot of high stakes drafters right now too. So there's a lot to like about Indianapolis and Richardson's uh, at the forefront of all that. Yeah, and they're going to run a lot of plays this year too. They're, they yeah. run a high number amount of plays and that would be yeah. huge for fantasy points as well too. Other, other guy we're high on um, Pacheco. Mm. There's in, in our evaluations, there's a clear 14 running backs. Then, then it drops off, and they're kind of the same after that. Pacheco's going end of the third, and I've even seen where he went, I think, 4-2 once. If you can get him end of the third round, Pacheco is worth every bit of that. Yeah, and I think he's going as RB11 right now. And if you, I think he has the potential to be a top five running back this year. Yes. So that's great value there. Is a hard running ball player. You guys have done some real great preparation. Bonky, some old friends are checking in with us uh, in, in the comments, and they, uh, they've they missed a hell of a show. They might have to, uh, what do you call that, replay, on demand? Yeah. What's Watch, that what, technology yeah. working it's, there? Exactly. Uh, Jimmy Williams, uh, who says he's uh, – He's late to the party. We already did talk about the Packers wide receiver room, Jimmy. So you can go watch the, the YouTube replay or start it from the start right now and catch up. That's totally up to you, whatever you want to do. But we did not talk about Ty J Spears and Tony Pollard, the, the Titans running backs. Um, do you guys have a feel on that at all? I, I, Bob, I'll let you go first on this. When it comes down to Spears or Pollard, is there a, a, a guy that you like better than the other, or are you just kind of splitting the difference? I, I really like Spears before they got Pollard. Now that they're both there, they're the same exact player. I'm not sure how they're going to use them. Um, Pollard had trouble last year because my Cowboys, one of their downfalls is we run when they, we run the ball, we run it up the middle. Pollard can't run the ball up the middle. I don't think Tajay Spears can run the ball up the middle. So are they going to change their offensive scheme because they're used to running up the middle with the hammer Derrick Henry? Um, now they're going to have to change the whole offense because I don't think either one of those two can run between the tackles. And I, I, do. don't, I don't know which one's going to end up getting more receptions because, to me, they're the same player. Mm -hmm. You are 100% correct. And, Balky, I think if you take a look at the biggest changes in Tennessee besides the, uh, the moving on of Henry – might be the draft and how much draft capital was spent on the offensive line because it was horrid last year and Henry made Henry covered that up. I don't know if these two running backs can cover it up. Do, do you guys think between these two running backs there's a hundred catches? I kind of think there is. Oh yeah, I think there's definitely a hundred catches between the two of them. Yeah, and actually these two what? these two would be great in a in my mind in a best ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not so much in the main event, yeah. but in the best ball, I think they would be they'd be better in that format. Or if you could somehow combine them into one body, then yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dave Kirk's working on that in yeah. his laboratory right now. He probably is. He probably he is. is. He's working on it. Uh, guys, what a treat it was hanging out with you tonight, talking football. Uh, this was a lot of fun. A uh, couple of things. Number one, thank you for coming on. Number two, you're having us. Thank absolutely. You. Number two, good luck in pros versus Joes. I know you'll do the Joes proud. Um, good luck in the main event this year as well as you try to go and gun for that $1 million. I know you got a couple of main event drafts already in the can and you're working on another one right now. Um, and um, when we do broadcast, do you guys know when you're drafting, what night you're drafting? And no. Okay. The guy in charge hasn't sent that to us yet. Okay. I think he, that's Darren Armani. He's still figuring things out. We, we got some time to figure that out. But if you are drafting live and not in the slow draft, 
we'd love to have you guys pop on for five, 10 minutes or so during when we broadcast that draft live on the YouTube channel. Uh, so we can find out kind of what you guys are thinking and maybe you can even make a pick live on air. That'd be yeah. tremendous. Uh, but we'll figure that out when it comes to it. Yeah, and gentlemen, you, you've got a standing invitation to come play live in Kentucky. You know, you can, you can leave the confines of the state of Pennsylvania and enjoy live <laughs> play uh, here in, in, in the bluegrass. And, and I got to tell you, uh, you guys are going to continue, I, I think. And you, how many main events in FFPC have you already played? Uh, we've done th – I think I've got three in so far. I'm, I'm working that on is, my third one right now. That's fantastic. And I would I would say at this rate that you're going to be one of the most prolific players in the contest. However, it, it, I will encourage you to expand your territory in every way that you can uh, because you guys are good players, knowledgeable players. Here we are in June – and you are September ready. So congratulations with everything you're doing in fantasy football. And it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Yep. Thanks, Thanks, guys. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. We'll talk with you again real soon. That, ladies and gentlemen, are the six-time FFPC main event champions joining us tonight. Uh, Bob Tipton and Rick uh, Lowe, uh, who are going to be drafting in the Pros versus Joe's Championship uh, coming up next month. We'll broadcast that draft live on the FFPC YouTube channel as well. Awesome to hear from them uh, tonight, uh, and I learned a lot. I learned uh, uh, that I have to go to the, to the what was it, the Countryside Grill in. in if they come uh, here to Louisville, we'll buy them breakfast. Yeah, we'll buy them breakfast Ooh. for sure, and, and I'll make a trip up to Pennsylvania too. Uh, the next time I get over that way, maybe Turp. I could I could hang out with Turp, and we could go over there too. It's I know from it's probably, Philadelphia, it, it's opposite, opposite ends of the state, but it's still the same state. So I don't Turp's know. Maybe from New Jersey. I could make a I could make a road trip out of it, Farrell. Um. Okay, let's get into some emails here, and uh, you I'll can to talk to these guys about Pollard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. do that. Really um, what? Speaking of New Jersey, we'll go to New Jersey. Mike in Camden, New Jersey, is Trey Sermon good enough to be drafted as the backup to Jonathan Taylor this year? Mike, thank you for the email. Really appreciate it. Um, I, so, so the I don't necessarily view player running backs as handcuffs anymore. I just view them as depth on my team, and I'll keep them around uh, for those injury away type. Um, situations, but they have to be good. And if the, the guy goes down in front of them, they have to get the lion's share of the carries. Now, I don't know, maybe if Evan Hull is healthy, he takes away third downs if Taylor misses time um, and, and Sermon isn't out there on third downs. I don't know, but he's going so cheap right now. And, and I think we just got a report earlier this week that Sermon looks to be the backup behind Taylor there. We just talked about how much we love the Colts offense this year, Farrell. I'm probably going to have Trey Sermon on a decent amount of teams this year. Really? He's had a hard time getting his career started, and he's still got to prove some things. So, no, I would not spend one of your precious 20-round draft picks on this player. I'd, I would rather spend, um, when I learned that he's going to be activated and taking first-team uh, reps before he plays, that's when I would spend my free agency money on And Oh, okay, so you would wait that long. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, he's, I mean... I don't know. Dylan Lobby, A.J. Dylan, Isaac Garendo, Eric Gray territory. I mean, it's 18th round. I, I, I get Okay, it. fair enough. Um, I, I think you need to find your uh, Puka Nakua in that 18th round book. You know, and I'm not saying he's going to be Puka Nakua, but there's two interesting receivers in that. I'll, I'll say three. Um, okay, let's hear uh, Nelson Sousa is a big fan of Javon Baker. Now, Nelson Sousa, who was on – the uh, uh, live draft coverage of the Fantasy Pros Championship last night with Aiden LaCore and Dave Tripoli. Um, I don't know if he talked about Baker. I, I don't remember him talking about Baker last night, but I know he's talked about Javon Baker before. And I know Nelson's a Patriots fan, but he liked Javon Baker before the Patriots drafted him. And, okay. and Baker is a guy that I would look at in the 18th round. I think Jalen McMillan is a really interesting redraft possibility this year because I think he's polished enough to play right away. And he's got uh, Mike Evans, who's on the wrong side of 30, and Chris Godwin ahead of him, who is no stranger to the trainer's room. So I think there's something there as well. And then Jalen Hyatt, who has been talked up by the Giants coaching staff, a guy who was a rookie last year, maybe making that sophomore jump. Again, I don't think any of those guys are going to be Puka Nakua this year, but I could tell myself a story where they're definitely worth an 18th round pick this year yeah. and perhaps over those running backs as well. That's who I want in the 18th round, not a backup unproven running back. Well, um, the uh, so so this next one is about actually Cooper Cup, Fred in Miramar, Florida. Hello, HSFF hour. Are you guys buying in to Cup hype to the Cup hype we've heard out of Los Angeles this summer already? Thank you as always. That's Fred in Miramar, Florida. Now it's interesting 
that Fred brings this up because I was reading a blurb on Roto World. Um, I don't know if it was today or yesterday. I think it was today. Um, and apparently he's been healthy. Yeah, Sarah Barshop from ESPN said this a couple of days ago that he's been a, quote, surprise offseason standout for the Rams. The, the former um, NFL Offensive Player of the Year from a couple of years ago is a surprise offseason standout. For the <laughs> is really Looking bizarre. good in shorts, Bo. Yeah, uh, he's 31 years old. Um, he said um, that – Sean McVay said that nobody really understands all the injuries and the level of injuries that he was going through last season. The last two years, 21 games – has not hit 1,000 yards in 2022 or 2023. Um, but when you look at what he – when he was healthy last year, he was targeted on 23% of his routes run last year. And and if you are believing that there's going to be a regression to the mean for Puka Nakua, then I think logically you could make the case that Cooper Cup might actually be uh, being underdrafted right now. He's not going until the fourth round, Farrell. What say you about Cooper Cup right now? You know, a conservative amount of Cup. Uh, on your multiple teams is, is something that I'm willing. It's a risk that I'm willing to take. This is a player who did not get, despite the fact he was a third round prick, he did not get the red carpet rolled out for him when he came in the NFL. He had to work through it. He came from a smaller school. Good things have happened for him. Much like Adam Thielen, um, we, we could find other players that fit that bill they had to work hard to get where they are, and they're not really going to let it be taken away from them without a fight. And I think there's a lot of fight in this player. And so I like him in the fourth round in certain situations. Yeah, I, I, depending upon what you did in the first three rounds, I think Cup could make some some really good sense for your team, for sure. Uh, last email that we have tonight is from Larry in Buffalo. Greetings and salutations. How much are you guys targeting Isaiah Likely in your drafts this season? That is Larry in Buffalo. Now, I will say right now, before we get into the analysis of Likely, Tight end 20 at the 1306. That's in the tight end premium fantasy pros championship right now. To me, that seems a little bit depressed, um, but he is behind Mark Andrews. However, when Andrews got hurt last year, Isaiah likely 28 targets over the last five regular season games. He caught 21 of them. He got over 300 yards and he got in the end zone five times. Um, Isaiah likely apparent. Now this is coming from likely. So, you know, <laughs> this is what he said. This is not what the Ravens said, but he said, uh, it's possible that he lines up in the backfield and the slot in line or split out wide by himself this year. Now, Isaiah likely clearly loves himself some Isaiah likely, but at the same time, I think there is something to be said for this, given that he is such a low pick in tight end premium leagues. How do you handle likely fair? If you have Andrews, are you looking to back him up in the 13th round with likely or is likely the type of pick that you make if you don't draft Andrews? Both. He is the most solid handcuff across fantasy football. Uh, he is the most solid handcuff that could become a standalone contributor with the player that you're handcuffing still being on the field. If you want to look at likely and not listen to what he says, but look at the work he has performed, he really can make all the catches. He makes the contested catches. He runs superior routes. His physicality has increased since he entered the league. There's nothing about this player that should make you want to shy away from drafting him in the 13th, 14th round. I probably overdraft him a little bit, um, and, and I believe I probably frustrated some Andrews drafters by drafting him a little early, but I believe in this player, and I believe in the fact that, that Baltimore, which is looking for different answers, now with Henry in the lineup, come into a situation where this player – at least gets five targets a game. There's a little honeywell of tight ends there that I know a lot of high stakes players seemingly um, have been talking. A lot of the tight ends that they've been talking up as late round tight ends. There's a little honeywell there in the in the 13th, 14th round with likely the rookie Ben Sinnott in Washington, and then Kate Otten, who I know some people have been talking up in the 14th round as well. So if you wait on tight end, or if you're looking for a backup, 13th, 14th round probably a good spot. Uh, Nothing's wrong with those other two guys, but if you look at the athleticism of those guys versus likely, it's no contest. Yeah, and and I, I could definitely get behind that as well. Farrell, whatever you say, I could get behind. I I uh, I don't always agree with it, but I will I will die. I'm, I'm really an act right line of it. yours, though. I really, <laughs> you know, you are my hero, Balky. 
Uh, you are a, a broadcast professional uh, mm-hmm. in Green Bay and the Wisconsin lower southern area, which you populate. Northeastern, northeastern. Yeah, that part too. <laughs> you claim it to be terrestrial. Here with us, you are better thought of as celestial. So I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, Farrell. Mm-hmm. And and this is why we have you on each and every week, so you can pump up my ego at the mm-hmm. end of the show. Um, Farrell, this was great hanging out with you tonight. We're going to do this again in less than 48 hours with live draft coverage at uh, of a Fantasy Pros Championship draft at 10 p.m. on Friday night. Me and you, and maybe we'll get some guests to pop in here and there as well. That'll be a lot. Have a hard time fun. following these guys. Yeah, they will. They will. You know. Somebody's got come to. with their A game. <laughs> Somebody's got to. So hopefully we'll get somebody on Friday night. Uh, it, but if we can't, I just enjoy chopping it up. We won't you. get better names. We yeah, we, we definitely will not get better names. These Low, names. never mind. Okay. K- KFFSC.com is where to go. Sign up for those main events, both live and online right now. Uh, such a pleasure, Farrell. Be good. We'll talk with you on Friday. Thank you, sir. The definitive commissioner of fantasy football, Farrell Elliott, joining me tonight on the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour. I want to thank him. I want to thank our guest tonight. I want to thank Bob Titman. I want to thank Rick Lowe. A lot of fun talking with those guys tonight. I want to thank the FFPC, Rob, Bryce, and, of course, each and every one of you for listening, downloading, streaming. Uh, We will be back, as I said, this Friday at 10 p.m. for live Fantasy Pros Championship draft coverage. I'm going to tell you, this is like the week of show. So I'm going to be out of town next week, and I don't want to leave people hanging without shows. So the FFPC YouTube channel, I think this is the first time we've ever done it. We are live Monday through Friday this week, every single night. Monday night, uh, you saw um, the High Stakes Fantasy Football Show with myself and Sean Siegel from Rotoviz and um, uh, Stealing Bananas podcast. So that was great to have him on. Or st- um, yeah, Stealing Bananas podcast, as he does with Ben Gretsch. Last night, Nelson Sousa, Aiden LaCorey, Dave Tirpoli with a live Fantasy Pros Championship draft. Tonight, we had uh, Bob and Rick on, who I already mentioned. Uh, tomorrow night, I will have another edition of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Show with Hilo FF, Mark Garcia from Fantasy Points and Roto World. That starts at 7 p.m. tomorrow, so that's going to be a lot of fun. And then Friday night at 10 p.m. Eastern time, we will have live draft coverage for you as well. Um, Fantasy Pros Championship has drafts filling every day. Remember to get in on the weekday giveaway. If you register and draft the team prior to Friday this week, you'll be entered into the drawing for three free Fantasy Pros Championship teams that we'll be giving away this year or this week i should say um, we'll announce that on in friday's email as well the main event the super flex best ball tournament and the classic best ball tournament all going on those drafts are popping off live and slow uh, drafts each and every day and of course empire leagues and dynasty startups are there for you as well at myffpc.com myffpc.com remember to like subscribe comment on this video share it with your friends and enemies and get notified each and every time we go live which will be tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Thanks for watching, everybody. Your week continues now. This has been another episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com. It was broadcast live and was watched around the world. Balky and Farrell will be back next week with more analysis, more interviews, and more advice from guests much smarter than they are. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk with you again next week. I did want to send a special shout out before we sign off tonight. I, I know I talked about um, how my brother, um, at, at way to the young age of 43, ended up passing away um, a little over a week ago. And I mentioned that on last Wednesday show with Mac Nova, Mackenzie Kramer. And to those of you who reached out with your sympathies and condolences, I do appreciate it. Um, the, the, the best, I mean, it, I've had such a great life <laughs> so far. Um, I'm only 44 years old. Um, and this is pretty much the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And we're still working through it as a family, but for anybody who is in that spot, um, I, I just, family and friends are so important to lean on. And I would just encourage everybody to make as many memories as you can now, uh, with them while they're still with you, because those are the things you hold on to, uh, and when, when it's over and at the end, thanks so much for watching. I will talk with you on Thursday and Friday this week. Be good, everybody.